So I wonder, first of all, if I could just get your overview of how how it's gone from your perspective, the new regulations, the new cars, a fascinating time for you and, and how you see the seasons uh, unfolding. Yeah, well, it's been, I mean, after many years of research, I mean, as you will probably remember, we kicked this project off in, in uh, 2017 um, when Ross Braun put together the group to, uh, to look at the regulations. And we had the delay for COVID, so it's been a lot of work gone into it. Um, and we were pretty sure from all of our research that we were going to make a good step. Um, but what we hadn't, what we couldn't predict was how much of, of the goodness of the, of the DNA of this ability to follow the teams would erode during their ongoing development for performance. <laughs> I mean, that's natural, isn't it? They're, they're, they have very different objectives to what we were setting out to achieve. Um, and whilst the initial part of this project was very, there's a lot of open dialogue, the teams were very... Um, was sort of very on board with the whole process. That that stops as soon as the teams get into their development phase. Clearly, they're not going to be reporting to us every other week about how their progress is looking and how the wake is looking, et cetera, et cetera. But no, I think it was it was pretty clear from some of the initial running that, that the drivers felt it was definitely better, the ability to follow and the sensitivity to the, to the car in front was a lot less. Um, so we were cautiously optimistic from the winter testing, but obviously that's nothing until you go racing. And then I think we've seen during the, you know, the last, the first four races that definitely it's going in the right direction. I think um, a lot of the research seems to have stuck. We've managed to, to make it, make an impression. I think it was fair to say, and we've always sort of sold this as being a, a process, not something that we expected to be a one, you know, a single fix. Um, you know, we wanted to put this, this process, this group in place so that we can be continually monitoring the way that the racing is going and addressing it as things go, um, you know, as things ebb and flow. Naturally, teams will find loopholes and maybe things will uh, will arise that will want to close down. But but no, I think it's best to say in in uh, in summary, we're, we're really pleased with the way that the, the, the racing is is starting to, uh, to sort of pan out. I mean, one of the most interesting things from the perspective of, a, of an observer is how different the approaches have been from all of the all of the top teams for a start, let alone the midfield as well. A massive variety of shape. Yes. Well, again, there's something that we couldn't we couldn't be sure, and there was I think initially a bit of um, skepticism that the cars might all look the same because we had to we had to focus on certain areas within the regulations to ensure that we kept as much of this sort of following ability uh, improvements that we'd found. And I think on initial inspection, some of the teams felt a bit nervous that perhaps it would it would sort of be a, like a, a GP1 series, effectively the cars would all look the same. Now, as you say, that's, that's been very much not the case. And it's it's the visible items that are very different. I mean, the bodywork, as, as you obviously well know, you know, we've got almost 10 completely individual sort of layouts, really. And we did a bit of work with the previous generation of cars where we removed all the livery on some images and we showed these images to team principals and chief technical people in teams and it was very very difficult to tell the difference between you know an Alfa Tauri and, and a Red Bull and a Ferrari and a Haas and even Mercedes and you know, Enstone sort of Alpine Renault at the time it, it was very difficult so the cars had evolved to something that looked very generic um, and I know it's the early phase of the new regulations, and there'll be some convergence with time. But no, we've been we've been really um, pleased with the way that there is a, an interest amongst the media and amongst the fans that the cars do look different. They look good, but also they look, there's, there's a bit of diversity in there. Now the big ten thousand dollar, ten million dollar question, probably Jason. How much, given the limitations on CFD and wind tunnel testing, how much? could the teams learn about what we now see as porpoising and bouncing on the cars? How much of that was evident over the winter? I think, and it's fair to say, we, we've had a lot of discussions with the teams in various forums, um, and it's pretty much caught all of us by surprise, the, the, the level of this, of the bouncing, the porpoising that's, that's been on track. Um, and I think it is fair to say that the tools that, that we use, the tools that the teams typically develop their cars with, being wind tunnels and CFD are at such a level now, particularly the wind tunnel testing, um, 
the quality of the models they're very stiff the, the balance is is also very um it's designed to make sure the model is all is in exactly the right place so you don't get something that we used to see in in wind tunnels of old where if the model wasn't particularly stiff or you had a particularly flexible front wing or or a floor on a sports car you sometimes get this porpoising in a wind tunnel environment um and, and but you don't really see that and don't think any teams can quickly put their hands up and say they've seen it now there's been a lot of backtracking to try and understand what's triggering it and how to resolve it and i guess some teams have seen it to greater or lesser degrees um but i think it's an interesting problem i mean we the teams have very much gravitated towards one end of the error map when we when we sort of put these regulations in place we could see that there was a a reasonably strong driver towards lower and lower right heights i guess what has been Quite surprising is how quickly the teams have all gravitated to these ultra low ride heights to the point where that's the limiting factor you can run as low as you can until the car becomes unstable then you have to prop the car up a bit or play with suspension settings to get the car a little bit uh, in a more comfortable window and uh, so there's two aspects i think there's the, the there's the aerodynamic design of the car and some of the details that you can play with which i'm sure will alleviate it and then the, the stiffness and the aspects of the vehicle dynamics, which um, not only the suspension stiffness, but also the, the physical stiffness of the floor and the, the components around the rear tire, the components around the forward floor. All of those stiffness aspects play a big role in what happens on, on track. And, uh, and I think we're all seeing that it is it's quite tough with, with the ATR limits that you've got at the moment, with the wind tunnel testing, with the CFD limits, and with the generic limits on track testing, you can't go out and try lots of different floors. You, you're relying that on your free practice um, one and two to do that sort of work. Is there any concern about the physical effect on the drivers that are suffering the bad uh, bouts of bouncing and porpoising and how stiff the cars are running? Well, I think the, the cars have definitely run, they're running very stiff because the, there is a, a big performance um, uh, benefit to running the car nice and low because what we're seeing with these cars is, as opposed to the previous generation where there would be a, a definite right height peak below which the, dra the, the rear downforce would drop off. Um, and you find this peak and you try and run the car around the peak in the grip limited, generally the slower speed corners. What we're seeing with these cars is they just keep picking up downforce the lower you go until you get to a point where the floor will stall because of the stiffness, because the, uh, the heave stiffness and the suspension um, springs is a very, is a very, um, very stiff setup. So the car will pop up, the downforce will pick up again as you get into this, this cycle. Um, we see it with some, some teams more severe than others. I mean, obviously, I think at the weekend, the, the Mercedes was particularly, um, it was quite extreme. Um, and I think there's some comments that they were finding it quite uncomfortable um, perhaps other drivers, maybe less extreme, don't find it to be as as off-putting. But clearly, there's a there's an incentive for the teams to resolve it and to pull the car out of that window because if it's uncomfortable with the driver, that's clearly not the quickest way around. Um, I don't think at the moment there's any there's any talk about the FI regulating it because the easy fix for regulating it would be to enforce a lower right height limit, in which case the cars all run a bit slower, but you run outside of this window. Um, but the teams were very vocal that they wanted, they were best placed to, to find the fix for this. And, uh, and I'm sure it won't take many more events before they get on top of it. Some teams seem to have made more progress than others, but I'm sure they'll all get there soon. Another interesting aspect, uh, which certainly I never saw coming, but it's nice to hear it again, is, is the talk of having to save weight on the cars now. It's something we're not used to having to, to listen to over the last few decades. But... All of a sudden, most of the cars are overweight. Maybe some are on the weight limit, but that, is that something you anticipated as well with that weight limit that you have? I think so. I mean, I think it's fair to say that the the switch to the 18 inch wheels and the bigger tires has brought to get brought a weight penalty with it. Um, and the other big driver was the uh, the additional safety features that have been implemented for this year. And as the teams were progressing through their design and refining it and maturing the design it was pretty clear that the weight was proving difficult to um, to shed. Now, it's not like they're not all overweight. I think there's one or two teams which have kind of managed to to fight for the uh, for the minimum weight, which is which is good. And I think it's unfair for them to have to sort of suffer the weight 
the minimum weight being raised because they've done a lot of work to ensure their car is, is on the limit. Um, but it does mean that most teams now are going through a weight saving exercise. And you see, I guess, some teams, even if they have of shaving a few hundred grams from not painting bodywork panels and things. So it is interesting. We, we're very mindful that we don't want the cars to perpetually get heavier. So we're already looking at the next generation of car to try and ensure that we put measures in place to try and engineer some more efficient structure into the car. Um, and, and a good example for that is suspension uh, elements, whereby some of the suspension solutions that the teams have evolved towards is totally dictated by aerodynamics for obvious reasons, and everyone does it, so it's almost negated the benefit. So they're all running cars which are structurally less efficient, a bit heavier than they need to be. If, for example, the regulations meant that everyone had to go for a, a different wishbone layout, for example, you could probably take some weight off all of the cars. You wouldn't notice the difference because they'd all, they'd all effectively take this small penalty. Um, no one would notice the difference in lap time, but it just means you could start to shed weight. So there's a few, a few areas like that where we think we can, um, we can probably help by regulation for the future, but it's not going to help us in the very short term. And just continuing that theme, is the size of the car also something that you're looking at? Yeah, very much so. Yes, I mean, the cars, I mean, they've got to this sort of two metre width and there's, we took a bit out of the wheelbase for this, for this generation, they're down to 3.6 metres. Um, but we would like, and we're working very hard with the, um, particularly with the power unit manufacturers, but now with the teams for the next generation of car, the 2026 car, to take a bit of size out of, out of them. So not only well, weight, but also width and, and length, um, just because clearly length and width brings with it weight. So if we can make the car a little bit smaller, then I think that will help this uh, overall objective. Just going back to the, uh, to the weight theme this year, we have had the situation already where you've you've allowed uh, additional stays for the floor to stiffen the floor, and yet some of the teams, Alpine is one, had a pretty stiff floor anyway, and and in a way that's a bit of an unfair penalty for them. It is, yeah. I mean, I think on, on balance it was it, it, it's a it's a temporary um, penalty for those guys because it's pretty clear that at some point, probably in the early part of the season, they'll have floor updates. And I, I guess you phase in your, your lightweight floor, perhaps using a floor stay. So I think on balance, it was it was viewed as probably the fairest solution, taking the whole season as, as, a, as, a, as a whole, effectively, rather than um, sort of penalising people for the entire season. It kind of gives the ability for those teams who perhaps took a little bit of weight will be able to deal with that. Uh, I'd imagine around sort of Barcelona time, if not a bit before. And finally, Jason, let's talk about DRS because we've had had an interesting race, obviously in, in Saudi Arabia, with a little bit of after you, Claude, going into the last corner, uh, and then we've had the San Marino Grand Prix. Obviously, Lewis, classic example, sitting in a DRS train now, able to sit very near Pierre Gasly's Alfa Tauri, but. DRS cancelling cancelling it all out. What, what is the thinking now about DRS going forward? Well, I think during the initial research, um, because we reduced this the size of the, sort of the, the hole that s- sits behind the car, we reduced the downforce loss, but we also reduced the toe. So we were a bit mindful that we probably weren't going to be able to just park DRS and, and sort of remove it from the regulations. And I think DRS for us is a very tunable feature. Um, it's very circuit dependent, and it can be can be it can be dialed in and out. I think most of us feel longer term we'd very much like to try and phase DRS out if we can, um, but we didn't think that was necessarily going to be the right thing to do overnight for these regulations. So, again, for the twenty twenty six car, we're looking at different solutions, and it might it may be that DRS doesn't have to have such a um, important role in the concept of those cars. Um, so at the moment, I think it's more down to how we how we prioritise DRS at the various events. Um, and again, we, as I said to you at the start, we, we couldn't be 100% sure that the teams wouldn't have undone you know, half of the work that we'd spent the last four years doing. Now it looks like they've managed to, we've managed to keep a lot of it. So that has meant, I think the teams can visibly run a lot closer um, through the corners and really onto the next straight. So we do get this, something that we haven't seen for a while, actually, it's sort of an overtake happens but you look over your shoulder and he's still there and he comes back at you. And I think that's something that has been quite refreshing um, 
for the first few races at various points. And it's not purely been DRS. There's been DRS cat and mouse, as you say. Um, but I think we've been quite pleased that, uh, yeah, the, the downforce retention is there. We just need to be careful that we don't um, ignore the fact that that naturally means the toe is a bit smaller. So you kind of need the toe effect, you know, the big hole in the air behind you to, um, to give you a little bit of a boost if you haven't got DRS. I presume you don't have software that would tell you what would have happened at Imola if there'd been no DRS, correct? No, we don't, no, but we do have, um, we have simulation tools which are getting there. And certainly this was in our in my previous role at FOM, the simulation tools there were pretty much designed for two car following. And we could then, that, that was where we realized that DRS would, would still be quite important. Um, as for replaying an event, that's not something that we've, I mean, I'm, actually we could probably try it, but we've not, we don't typically do that. Well, the FOM guys don't typically do that. But I thought it was quite interesting that because we had the sort of the dry, the drying track, we had almost half the race didn't we, with no DRS. And, uh, and I think it was interesting to see if that there were a few overtakes, weren't there, that happened with, before the DRS got switched yeah, on. Were, and then, yeah. Yeah, but then the DRS, um, you know, the DRS was cancelling each other out, wasn't it, in, in the particular example that you were talking about. I thought it was impressive, actually, how well the Williams kept the two the two DRS shod cars behind him. I mean, he did very well, Albon, didn't he? Well, I'm sure that's all due to the all the great aerodynamic work that Williams had uh, over the last decade or so, Jason. I'm sure. <laughs> sure, Pete. Yeah, it's all, it's all in there somewhere. Uh, just one final point. You mentioned tune. You said that you use the word tuning for DRS from circuit to circuit. It also springs to mind. Is it possible to tune the amount of opening that you have with the DRS, or would that not work because of the differences still from car to car with gurney flaps or whatever it is? It's an interesting one. I mean, there there is a there's a maximum eighty five millimeters opening at the moment, um, which teams designed to, and that's what their DRS is like a switch is in a two state, so either on or on off. Um, and without giving too much away, one of our one of our focuses on, on twenty twenty six is to sort of look at um, not necessarily just having a digital switch between different um, wing states, but also having something which is a bit more a bit more variable. Um, particularly because one of the focuses for the next generation of car is to be chasing efficiency. Um, you know, we don't want to be carrying a big barn door wing around the lap when we don't need to. Let's try and turn the drag down where we don't need it. So it brings on a different different challenges for how you um, how you make the racing interesting and competitive, but without the need to to use as much fuel. I think with the, with the focus on efficiency. So. It's very much something we're looking at for the 2026 car, and it might be something that perhaps we phase in a bit earlier um, on the 2022 generation of car. But for the time being, I think it would be more a case of tuning it via the, the trigger points on the, on, the, on the circuit. Great. Thank you so much, Jason, for that overview. Wonderful to chat about all that. I hope we can catch up with you perhaps later in the year, September, October time. It'd be interesting to see where Formula One is there and whether Mercedes have won a race by then. That'd be another interesting... Indeed. I don't think it'll take them long. They're, they're a strong bunch. I'm sure they're um, all heads down. They'll be back soon, I'm sure.